you have the text of my reply so that you can understand better my Italian English. And uh, first of all, I fully agree with the starting point stated in the first lines of Morton thesis, which I read because uh, he kindly sent me all the text of his work. And uh, Morton writes, many revolutionary new ideas that changed the face of Western civilization and Christendom forever have been conceived in dialogue with Paul's epistle to the Romans. Paradoxically, however, it was not so in the first centuries of the ancient church, especially in the pars orientis of the Roman world. At least the first letter to the Corinthians for intrinsic importance and for the attention paid by the ancient exegetes certainly stood next to it to the Romans, if not even surpassed it in importance. It is precisely with Augustine that in the West, the letter to the Romans became the key text of every subsequent theological and ecclesiological turning point, from Thomas Aquinas to Erasmus, from later to Wesley to Carbart, up to the Christian Judaism of Jacob Taubes, was the Politische Theologie des Paulus, again a close exegesis of the letter to the Romans, at the end of the second millennium marked in the name of a necessary and a new antinomy between Judaism and Christianity, the conclusion of the parable of the modern world, inaugurated by the forede posted by Luther at the beginning of his translation of Romans into German. This letter, says uh, Luther, is the most important part of the New Testament and the purest gospel. In this letter, we find, in fact, an excellent way what a Christian should know, that is, what the law, the gospel, sin, punishment, grace, faith are. I, uh, um, I stress the, the term law, the first one uh, emphasized by Luther. Therefore, it is as if in this letter Paul wanted to definitely summarize all the Christian teaching of the gospel and make a valuable way to access the Old Testament. In this sense, the indirect debate on Romans between Origen and Augustine, reconstructed by Morton, constitutes a crucial step in the construction of Origen's legacy in the West, about which the more general project of which this work we are discussing also is a part, has been concentrated. In his commentary on Romans, Origen is the most current follower of Paul in the direction of the universalization of the Christian message, even though Origen has a profound knowledge of Judaism and maintains strict relation with many of his contemporary Jewish rabbis, he considers that the nomistic horizon of the Old Testament has been definitively surpassed in favor of a total spiritual reading of it. The nodal point of the original interpretation as Morton correctly observes, is given by the polysemantic extension that origin operates on the term law, arriving, and here perhaps a deeper study would be useful, arriving to propose also a possible identification of the Pauline law with the more general law of nature, intrinsic to the creation of God and man, such as to put Jews and ethnic people on an equal footing both in terms of the possibility that has always existed of accessing a code of conduct and gnoxiology, and in terms of the substantial inability to observe it, in which man's guilt in the face of God and the consequent offer of salvation in Christ consist. And also the quotation just made by Lorenzo from the homily on Psalms he has just read, let open the possibility you have to, uh, you could answer, yes, it's possible that also ethnically as a sort of relation with Christ, as Justin before Origen says, or not. But in my opinion, in my interpretation of the text, but it's the first time I read, I read, I read uh, that passage, Origen does not answer immediately in a sense or in another.
but I don't know the subsequent text, so I can ask to Lorenzo to explain also on this point. Turning back to my paper, um, the problem of law is a key point in the comparison at distance with Augustine, which instead leads Paul's idea of nomos back to its original mosaic matrix. Augustine arrives in Books 21 of the, the Civitate Dei to affirm that Gentiles, for their own salvation, must be in some way incorporated into Israel and its history. Also, the new Israel, but Israel. That means in filigree to return under the domination of the law that necessarily condemns, but paradoxically open the way to the grace of the Spirit who alone saves. The, the Civitate Dei is beyond the chronological limits within which Morton conducted his analysis, but I think it's important to consider this work as the culmination of Augustine's exegetical parable with respect to the letter to the Romans. Not by chance, it also contains his more open stance toward origin, which in my opinion allows a full understanding of his attitude toward the doctrine of the latter's free will, even if as is well known, Augustine in book, 20, in book 20 criticized origin apparently only on the subject of the judgment of God and the eternity of punishment. In this context, first I will make two introductory observations on the historical and philological aspect of Morton's work. Then, in dialogue with the reconstruction of the relationship between Augustine and origin proposed by him, but also by Ilaria, uh, Ilaria's work, I will try to formulate some solicitation that may respond to the more general and cultural purpose of the project, of which Morton and Ilaria works also form part, namely the problem of human freedom and responsibility and responsible action as a legacy of the past still operating in the present. First of all, I think that Morton's assessment of Carolyn Amond Bummer's work is correct, as she was the first to draw attention to the possible use of Origen's commentary by Augustine in his interpretation of Roman in the Antipelagian period. Morton considers Bummer's point of view overestimated, or rather, he criticizes passive acceptance by subsequent scholars who have not considered how Augustine could have drawn on other sources which Morton instead showed persuasively in many cases in his whole work. In this regard, I would stress with greater force the decisive role that Ambrose could have played, who read Origen's commentary in the original Greek and not in Rufino's translation, as we learn from his correspondence. In some passages, he quotes the, the Origen commentary in a different way, in a more complete way, than uh, the translation of Rufinus in a passage uh, where Rufinus translates in some uh, manuscripts, um, we have uh, certain readings, or uh, um, Ambrose specifies that that was the reading of Aquila, and of course uh, he was quoting from the commentary of uh, Origen. Um, So, and this is important uh, mm, because uh, um, Ambrose uh, read Origen's commentary in the original Greek and not in Rufino's translation, as we learn from his correspondence, and above all, he read it without the prejudice determined by the later ecclesiastical condemnation, as Jerome will instead. For example, even though Ambrose expresses reservations about Origen's exegesis of the New Testament, while his admiration for the exegete of the Old Testament was unconditional, as is well known. Secondly, however, I would observe that Augustine's cherry-picking reception of Origen's commentary does not constitute a specific feature of his relationship with Origen, but was the normal modus operandi of any ancient exegete, closely linked to the procedure of commenting on the biblical text verse by verse leaving rather in the background the general framework of the interpretative scheme. In other words, the interpretation of single verses could easily be extrapolated from any commentary, regardless of the general hermeneutical approach 
of the author of that interpretation if these textual segments were useful for illustrating the same or other biblical verses within another, another even divergent exegetical or theological perspective proposed by another writer. This did not imply either the dependence of the interpretation of one author from the, author, the, other, the other one or their constant opposition if they differed on relevant points. The exchange of letters between Augustine and Jerome, which has been studied by another leader of this group, Alphonse Furst, uh, illustrates this dynamic well, for example, with regard to the interpretation of Galatians, the famous passage in, in which Paul criticized Peter. The fundamental point of contrast between Origen and Augustine on the theme of freedom and law, grace and free will, does not lie in the specific interpretation of the letter to the Romans, but in the theological vision that lies before exegesis and that inspires. Simplifying a lot, one could say that Origen's perspective is metaphysical, meaning by this term the wall of his protology and his eschatology, while Augustine's perspective is strictly historical. For Origen, the Bible, and therefore also Romans, speaks of the descent, ascent of the Logos of God, paradigm of the analogous path that every human being has to run between the first intellectual creation and the final apocatastasis. Augustine instead concentrates his attention on the path that begins with the fall of the ancestors and ends with the judgment that will only dissolve the ignorance to which Augustine resigns himself with regard to the divine election, as Morton closes his work. Origen's final apocatastasis shed a light on the world of the world and the human beings, making them brilliantly shining, while Augustine's undecipherable history of sin and conviction wraps them both in darkness. Given these historical and philological premises, I would like to try to formulate some suggestions that place the debate between Augustine and Origen in the context of contemporary cultural and scientific debates. And in this respect, I can address also Ilaria. It is clear that the problem of human self-determination can no longer be read in the theological terms with which it is posed by the two great ancient exegetes that is a conflict between free will and predestination. Rather, a possible point of reference in antiquity could be identified with the determinism of the Stoics linked to their conception of nature and cosmic de development. The most radical interpretation of the outcomes of the contemporary neurosciences, in fact, seem to remove any possibility of thinking about human action outside of the double conditioning of the genetic code, the personal genetic code, and the cultural and the educational inputs received in the first three, five years of life. Against this deterministic and, in the end, removing responsibility view, some contemporary philosophers and psychologists try to de develop new concepts such as those of animal agency or agent causation that is the view that the agent himself and not some events inside and or outside the agent starts and manages the performance of an action. So redefining the traditional concept of libertarian freedom or free will. In, in other words, the, the most radical interpretation of the result of uh, the research, of contemporary research on uh, uh, neurosciences, uh, destroys the, the, our assumption that human mind uh, is the same, um, the human beings are the same all over the world. Not because they are not the same, but because the has deeply changed the, the way of interpreting the, the way in which human beings uh, operate. Our brain is more uh, function without any necessity of a soul, without any necessity of a free will. It functions on itself, on the basis of the genetic code, the basic impulse, uh, fear, love, and so on, and determines our decision, our behavior, and so on. Of course, this is a, the radical one interpretation of uh, neurosciences. But uh, 
In this sense, uh, this is a, a, um, a challenge much more radical than to discuss how uh, can uh, interact uh, human uh, sciences and uh, humanities and, uh, and other sciences. Because the problem is the, the man himself, the human nature, if we can still speak of human nature. Um, in other words, they try to redefine something comparable to the idea of the soul that is central in Origen's vision as the place where the human subject could act on the basis of somewhat similar to a voluntary choice and not simply reacting to basic and unconscious impulses. Why is the soul still necessary is in fact the title of a book by one of the most important Italian scholars in neurosciences. Could we say that Origen's concept of freedom and free will and its deep relationship with the soul as a place within man, human beings, where one could choose between the psyche and the sarx, this concept is still inspiring in temporary world as it has been in many other historical and cultural circumstances. A second aspect of the debate between Augustine and the origin of free will can be taken into account for its relevance in the contemporary context. Morton correctly states that even for origin, human beings in the historical context of their action cannot ever fully correspond to the divine commandment. However, unlike Augustine, origin also tries to explain the differences in difficulty that each individual encounters in his attempt to live up to his task. If one wants to use the vocabulary of contemporary moral philosophy, for example, that of Martin Nussbaum, one could say that, unlike Augustine, Origen takes on the problem of the disadvantage in the face of God justice. His theory of a personal sin prior to incorporation, in fact, seeks a rational answer to the exegetical problem of God's preference for Isaac over Jacob since the womb of their mother. Warm origin assumes as a paradigm of the different spiritual, con spiritual and also material condition of human beings in the world. Certainly, in this way, origin pushes the problem out of the course of human history, as I said before, into the noetic world of rational beings. But in doing so, he makes God's judgment at the end of individual history understandable and legitimate also from the human point of view. If we start from different starting point, also God's judgment will take into account this difference. And this, these different starting point are the Prado in, in the world, in the incorporated world, in the incorporated life, are a fruit of our previous choice, our, our previous sins or good choice. In this sense, uh, chapter 8 uh, of the letter to the Romans, reflecting on the glory of God's children and the desire of all creation to be associated with them, plays a key role. Nevertheless, on a secular and present plane, the arch criticism moved to origins apocatastasis by Augustine, who charged him of negating the very dimension of justice in the exclusive favor of God mercy, could help to redefine the respective implication of punishment and rehabilitation in the actual practice of legal justice. Finally, I would like to add a last general remarks about the scholarly revival of origin that took place in the second half of the last century, mainly within the most advanced theological milieu in French and German. Origen's standard image inherited by mid-century scholarship was substantially shaped by the late 18 and early 19th great German Protestant theologian Adolf von Arne. In his view, Origen was the first systematic theologian who built up the dogmatic buildings of the early Christian orthodoxy by mingling the original Semitic and biblical feature of Jesus' teaching with the mainstream philosophy of Origen's day, that is to say Platonism, on the ethical plan, and Stoicism. The new Origen, painted by subsequent Catholic theologians 
as the Lubac, Daniel Uraner, and von Balthas, had opposite characteristics. Instead of being the creator of a dogmatic theological system, he was a thinker engaged in a never-ending search for a never-deeper comprehension of God's mystery, of mercy and forgiveness, mainly through a personal, that is to say non-dogmatic by definition, reading and self-appropriation of the biblical text. Far from corrupting the genuine, original content of Jesus' message, Origen tried to translocate it, the most faithfully could, in the Greek cultural world, following a path already traced by some of his predecessors, among whom the very, song, the very same Paul. Philosophy was no more than a linguistic code to speak with the Greek and Jewish Hellenized people in the name of the true Christian universalism, opposite to the Roman political imperialism. In this way, Origen became the inspiring model for ecclesiastical reformers, as the young new theologians were, instead of the archetype of every dogmatic theologian. Now, Origen has trespassed the boundaries of the ecclesiastical world and found a prominent position within the contemporary academic and cultural world, as this European doctorate also shows. Of course, the academic, the in the humanities world, academic world. And I close with a, uh, with a question. Do you think that such a secularization of the vir ecclesiasticus origin, as he used to define himself, and the complex events of his biography, perhaps, can help us to rethink the role of intellectual leaders in contemporary society, especially within the dialectic between recognized authorities and personal path, in the context of any established milieu, such as the university or other research institution, in which progress can be strengthened, but also discouraged by mainstream trends. In some way, your direct engagement with origin in the framework of this doctoral program could have been an interesting case study. Thank you.